Would you look with me in 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 7? This is God's Word, and this is our fourth and final look at this paragraph. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. Now, here's our focus today. As each one has received a gift, use it in serving or use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's multifaceted or varied grace. Whoever speaks, whoever speaks is one who speaks oracles of God. Whoever serves is one who serves by the strength that God supplies in order that In everything, God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belongs glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. The grass withers, the flower fades, God's Word abides forever. By His grace and mercy, may His Word be preached for you. Please be seated. So many of you know that this past week there was a… there was the, uh, the week of the NFL draft. Now, I know most of you are just concerned about the college draft, but, uh, but the NFL draft, and you probably, I, I just happened to be seated reading something with the mindlessly, the television on, emphasize mindlessly, the television on, and they were going through the draft, and they had these pictures of coaches calling the athletes. Now, you know what happens. The general manager and the coach get together. They're designing the team. They're looking at this pool of athletes. Who has the ability? Who fits in? Who fits? How are they? they, We're designing a team. How do they fit? And then they choose them. And usually what happens is the coach gives them a call. And as the coach gives the athlete a call, he knows that he has been selected to be a part of that team for a vital and reason that he fits right there. And uh, they were having some of those pictures of the coaches calling the athletes and, um, while it was all going on. At that very moment, I got a phone call. I looked at my phone, Frank Reich, head coach, Indianapolis, Indianapolis Colts. Could be. <laughs> and, and so uh, I uh, picked, why are y'all laughing at that? So I picked it up and I said, Frank? He said, Harry? I said, yeah, you just call me. He said, oh, I'm sorry, that was an accidental pocket call. Well, my dream just went out the door right there. He said, "Uh, hey, how are you doing? I said, doing good. And uh, so we talked for a few moments. And and so even though the call came from a head coach during draft week, during the day they were calling, uh, and I got a call, it was not to be drafted. It was just an accidental pocket call. But you're about to get a call. In the next 30 minutes... I'm going to give you a call on behalf of the Lord. And it's not a pocket call, accidental. It's a providential call on purpose. God's team, the body of Christ, His church, He not only has a place for you in it, He has designed you for a special purpose that absolutely nobody else can do like you can do because he has gifted you especially for it. And he called you onto that team, into the body of Christ, that you are to be a part of it. Now, it's been a month since we were in this text, so I'm going to take five minutes, four minutes, and remind you of the context of this epistle. This is Peter. You can see Peter fulfilling the commission that the Lord had given him. 
The Lord, the last thing the Lord said to him personally after he restored him from his three denials was, feed my sheep, tend my flock, nurture my lambs. And that's what he's doing, even though he's never been to these churches in Asia Minor. Even though he's only got the questions that they've sent him and the concerns that he has heard. Even though he doesn't, he's never been there and likely will never get there, he does know what Christ would have them know in serving him, loving him, and following him. And he does know what what they're going to face, and he does know who they are, and he does know what they're supposed to do. So he starts off by reaching into the Old Testament imagery of the people of God being set free in the Exodus through the wilderness to get to the promised land, and he says to them, you are elect exiles. You are elect pilgrims. You are elect sojourners. That's what you are. Now, who are you in Christ? You're the elect. And he enumerates in the first epistle through where we have arrived in chapter 4, verse 7, he enumerates 14 marks of God's sovereign grace secured in Christ at the cross for the believer. 14 marks he has secured for them. He says, this is who you are in Christ. And then he gives them, and then he also, by the time we get to where we are in chapter 4, verses 7 through 11, he has given seven gospel commands of what you do for Christ. See, elect, this is who you are in Christ, 14 marks. Exiles on the journey to home to serve Christ in this world, here is how you're supposed to live for him. Now, notice, he doesn't tell you how you live till he tells you who you are. Then having told you who you are because of Christ, he then tells you how to live, lest you think the way we live is what makes us who we are in Christ. No, you are who you are. I am who I am in Christ because of what Christ has done on the cross and then sent his spirit to bring us to himself. Now, that same spirit is then compelling us to fulfill these gospel commands because we love him, and if you love me, he says, you'll keep my commandments. And in the midst of all of this, one more thing, he has now taken almost a half of this book to tell you what to expect as you serve Christ who has secured you as elect exiles in this world. And what he tells you is you're going to encounter Christian suffering. Every Christian, to some degree, every true Christian, not nominal, every true Christian, to some degree, at some time, in some way, I love the way my mentor, uh, Dr. Martin, said it. Every Christian, to some degree, at some time, in some way, will suffer persecution. Jesus said it, blessed are you, not if, but when men revile you and persecute you. If they persecuted me, how much more will they persecute me? James says it. John, uh, Jude says it. Paul says it. Paul says, all who live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. It has been granted unto you not only to believe in him, but to suffer for his sake. So it's very clear to some degree, in some way, at some time, all who live for Christ can expect not parades, but persecution either upon livelihood or upon lives. Now, how should we respond? He goes from 1 Peter 3, 13, all the way to chapter 5, verse 11, and we're right in the middle of it, to equip us as to how to handle Christian suffering. Not Christians suffering simply because it's a broken world, but Christians suffering because they own Christ and speak for Christ. This is how you are to engage. You're always ready to give an account of the hope that's within you. And as he has fleshed all this out, we now come to chapter 4 and verse 7, in which we have the seventh gospel command. Now, by the way, just I'm not going through them. I've put on the back of your note sheet, this is the third time I've done it, and I want to do it again for you, because we haven't been here for a while. I've got the 14 gospel blessings of the elect in Christ, and then the seven gospel commands from Christ as to how do we live for Christ on the back of your note sheet. But now, what I want you to see is that seventh command. Look at that seventh command, that seventh gospel command that stands before us. He says this, that we are to pursue and cultivate a sound and sober mind marked by a life filled with prayer. So we're to have be sober-minded and sound-minded, and we are to be marked by prayer. And then he says this to us. He said, now I want you to know this. When you develop a mind for Christ because you have a heart from Christ— 
and a heart for Christ and a mind of Christ. He says it will be sober. You see life with clarity, and then it will be sound. You see life accurately because your mind is not being conformed to the world but transformed by the renewing of your mind through the preaching, the study, the teaching, the singing, the meditating, the praying of the Word of God, then your mind is being changed. You see, when you become a Christian, you get a new heart, you get a new family, you get a new record, you get a new life, but you don't get a new mind. But you do get the Word of God and the Spirit of God whereby you can renew your mind so that you can begin to think with the mind of Christ. And when you do, there is a mark of sobriety. There's a mark of, um, and there's a mark of, uh, of um, sobriety and a mark of soundness, and your life will be filled up with prayer. Not only will there be prayer meetings, there will be a praying life. And then he says this, And this is where we left off. Peter's premier priority, his premier priority for the believers was this. Let, here's what he says. As you are cultivating a sober and sound mind, Peter's premier priority for the elect exiles is above all things. Now, not instead of all things, not in spite of all things, not as a summation of all things, but above all things, I want you to love one another. You can almost hear him listening to Jesus. By this, they will know that you're my disciples, that you love one another. I give you a new commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. And so he says, above all things, I want you to love one another. The Apostle John at Ephesus, when he was dying, we are told from extra biblical history that they brought him into the church at Ephesus. And as he was dying, they lifted him up off the cot. They had to hold him up. He could barely get any words out. And what tradition records was his repetition three times of one statement. He looked at the church and said, love one another. Love one another. Love one another. And so for the rest of chapter 4, verses 7 through 11, He's telling us about two kinds of love, redemptive love and serving love. Redemptive love, your brother is going to sin. What do you do? Now, watch this, folks. Sin brings guilt. Guilt brings shame. So what you do is you want to love your brother away from the shame back to the cross because there is therefore there no condemnation. And you want to lead them to mortify their sins, not manage their sins. Every believer is a sinner saved by grace. So when we sin, we don't manage sin like it's a syndrome. We mortify it. We kill it. And when a brother gets caught up in an entangling sin, what do we do? Well, you know that sin brings guilt and guilt brings shame, but we don't shame them. Love covers a multitude of sins. It doesn't mean it ignores it. The Bible tells us, Matthew 18, if your brother sins, go to him. The Bible tells you to bring one or two with you if that doesn't work. The Bible tells you to bring the elders involved in it if that's necessary. But we don't expose one another. We don't expose one another. We deal with one another with proportionality. And then not only does love cover the multitude of sin, but we love earnestly. We keep stretching uh, the way, I mean, I don't, I'm not going to discuss the Kentucky Derby yesterday because I didn't get a chance to work. But I know, I know how those horses run. They stretch out at the end. That's the very word that's used from the Greek to discuss fervently, earnestly. It means to stretch out in a race. That's the way we love one another. We stretch out ourselves. And then he says, and now you want to, here's something you can do. If your brother sins, when you love one another, just open up your door and open up your house and put him a t- seat at the table. Show hospitality without grumbling. That we would be marked by hospitality. For the Bible says, through such you have entertained angels. So we have a hospitable place. 
Now he turns from this redemptive love to serving love. And he says this, as each one of you have received a spiritual gift, use it in serving one another. In fact, would you mind going back and looking at that text, please, just one more time. And I'm going to rapidly go through it with you, but I want you to get a hold of it. He says this, as each one of you, go to verse 10. He says this, as each one has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's very grace, whoever speaks as one one who speaks oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Now, here's what he's saying to you. He is saying this. He's, I'm going to do this with twos. I want to give you two precepts. I then want to give you not only two precepts, I want to give you two practices, two parts, and two principles, all from those two verses. Here's, here's the first. What are the first two principles? The first principle is this. Each one of you has received a spiritual gift by the grace of God. Each Christian has received a spiritual gift by God's grace. Carrie, what do you mean? How do you know it's by grace? You didn't come up with it. You didn't originate it. You didn't create it. You have, notice what it says, as each one, that means every single believer, If you are a Christian today, you have a spiritual gift. The same grace that saves you is the grace that equips you. And he equips you with the spiritual gift. Each one of you has, notice what he says, received. It's something that was given to you as a testimony of God's varied grace. None of our gifts are alike. They're all unique. Each Christian has received a unique spiritual gift from the Lord by the grace of God. What's the second precept? You've been given this gift to employ it, to use it. Each Christian is to use their gift in concert with one another in the body of Christ. Now watch, watch this. You're saved personally. You're given a spiritual gift personally, but you weren't saved to live privately, and you weren't saved to live isolated. You were saved personally to be joined to the body of Christ, and that as you're joined to the body of Christ, you are to take your gift and use it to serve one another. That's why you've been given the gift. It's not for personal. Well, I got this gift and I want to satisfy myself. No, no. You've been given the gift to satisfy others. You've been given the gift to serve one another. Now, let me tell you something. Praise the Lord. It's more blessed to give than to receive. So when you start blessing others with your spiritual gift, you're going to get a blessing. But the point of your spiritual gift is not your blessing. The point of your spiritual gift is to equip you to be a part of the body of Christ to bless others. So we have, so here's your two precepts. Each Christian has received a spiritual, a unique spiritual gift by God's sovereign grace. And each Christian has, has, is to use their gift, employ their gift in concert with one another, the body of Christ. That's what we were talking about a while ago. We, we had this up from 1 Corinthians 12. Hold it, wait, stop right here. I, I am, I'm struggling, I'm struggling because this is so rich, this is so much, and I, so I, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to come back and preach a topical expository series on, on spiritual gifts on a Sunday night pretty soon, all right? That's number one. And here are the passages. If you want to go ahead and start reading, if you want to study spiritual gifts, go to 1 Corinthians 12, go to Romans 12, go to Ephesians 4, and go to right here, 1 Peter 4. That's where you want to go, those four places. But you know what you're going to see? Paul, where Paul has spiritual gifts, he always follows it with a chapter on love. He'll talk about spiritual gifts, then he'll talk about love. But Peter doesn't. Peter talks about love, and then he talks about spiritual gifts. Harry, why? I don't have the slightest idea. But I'm going to ask him when I get there. Why did Paul talk about spiritual gifts and then talk about love? Why did you talk about love and then talk about spiritual gifts? I'm sure I'm going to get an answer. I just don't know what it is. But that's what, I, that's what you'll see. And the other thing you'll see is, but Paul and Peter are in absolute agreement. 
Each believer has a gift, and it was given by the Holy Spirit, and it was given sovereignly. He gives his gift, did you, last thing out of your mouth in the confession, as he wills by his Spirit. So God sovereignly has saved you. God sovereignly has gifted you by his grace as he wills, and he has uniquely fashioned you like nobody else in the body of Christ to take your place. Hand, foot, finger, mouth, uh, heart, organs, kidney. I don't know what part you are, but you're a part of the body of Christ. Or if you want to use the team metaphor, you fit on the team in a certain way to do that which he has equipped you to do that nobody else can do. So here is, so here are the two precepts. Now those two precepts are followed, got to do this faster. These next two pre- are followed by two practices. What are the two practices? To use your spiritual gifts, you've got to develop a servant's heart. You've got to have servanthood. You've got to have a servant's heart. Use your gifts to, do you see it? Serve one another. You've got to have a servant's heart to use your spiritual gift. In other words, it's not, here I am, church, what are you going to do for me? If I may quote JFK, who I think robbed the line from somebody else, that's not what you can do for your country but what, and that's not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. Now, I think he got that from somebody. I'm not sure. But, um, but I'll just say this. That's not what I can do for you. That's not what my church can do for me, but that's what I can do for my church. Now, I'm, listen, I understand. I, you can argue with me on that. Well, I want to make sure you preach the word. I want to make, yeah, I understand all that. But don't enter in who's going to be my friend, who's going to do this, who's going to do this. But who will I love? Who will I minister to? Who can I serve? But here's the problem. We all love to talk about servanthood as long as we're talking about somebody else. And we all love to talk about servanthood until somebody treats us like one. You've got to cultivate the heart of a servant to embrace servanthood. And then the second thing is, is stewardship, oikonomos, the rules of the house. Now, we know about stewardship. God's given me my resources. I'm not going to rob God. I'm going to bring the tithe into work. What would happen in the church of Jesus Christ if everybody tithed? (laughs) That'd be astounding. But you say, I'm not going to rob God. I'm going to bring the tithe in worship into the storehouse to praise God. And I've got offerings that I'm going to bring as well. And I've got a home. I'm going to use that for the Lord. And I've got children. They belong to the Lord. I've got a marriage. My spouse belongs to the Lord. I've got a job. I've got responsibilities. I've been given influence. I want to be a good steward. What is required of a steward? One word. Faithful. Faithful to the master's directions in the house. And you are his house. And his church is his house. That is the gathering of God's people. So, Lord, give me a steward. I want to be faithful. I want to use, according to your word, not only my resources, but my spiritual gift. I want to be a good steward of my unique, varied gift of grace that you've given to me. Number three, there are two categories Two categories of spiritual gifts. There are speaking gifts and serving gifts. Did you see it? It says that those who speak, let them speak the oracles of God. Those who serve according to the strength which God supplies. So they're speaking and they're serving. Let me be be clear here. The, The Bible's not saying there's two gifts, speaking and serving. The Bible is saying there's two categories of gifts, speaking and serving. It's reflected in the ordained offices. What are the two ordained offices in the church? Elder apt to teach. Diaconos, deacons, serving of the tables of the church. So here is speaking and serving. But these these are not, so they're not summations of every gift, but they are categories. Here's a great little thing for you to do. Maybe I can get to it soon. Go get Romans 12, go get 1 Corinthians 12, list the gifts, and then see how they fit in those two categories. And then how the officers are to oversee them. But let me ask you, should elders serve? Yes. Should servants speak? Yes. So he says this, if your gift is speaking, that doesn't mean you're not a servant. And if your gift is being a servant, that doesn't mean you don't speak. 
They're interdependent, but it gives you direction in terms of categories of where you speak. But here's what he really wants to get to. If, the, if your gift is focused upon speaking in the body of Christ, then your gift must always be committed to speak the Word of God. Only the oracles of God, not the philosophy of the world, not the spirit of the age. Speak the word of God. And if you're a servant, listen, servanthood in the body of Christ, you can't do that on your own, on your own dime, on your own nickel. You need the Holy Spirit. You need the strength which God supplies. That's what you need in your life. So you got two precepts, you got two practices, uh, two practices, servanthood and stewardship. You got two parts of the two categories that is speaking and serving. And finally, there are two principles. Principle number one is this you have been saved and you have been given a gift. You have been saved and gifted for one reason, and that uh, because of one thing, and that is the grace of God in Christ. You have been saved and gifted by the grace of God in Christ. It's amazing. And I want to tell y'all something. Here's something I've noticed. Many times God's gift is usually in direct opposition to your life apart from Christ. I was an abject blasphemer. And now I get to speak and teach the Word of God. Paul killed Christians. He became an evangelist. Paul destroyed the church. He became the greatest church planter. It's amazing how God's evidence of his grace shows up, and nobody could say, well, no wonder he's that. We, ought, we could see that in his life. No, no. God not only forgives us, God equips us, and many times he delights in taking people from their vices in rebellion against him and using that to create the virtues of how they can serve him. So you have, been, you have been saved and sealed and, and gifted by the grace of God in Christ. And then the second, the second um, principle is this. You have been saved and gifted for the glory of God in Christ. Why? You don't have to. You can't miss this, folks. Here's what he says. Why has God called you to this? Here's what he says. He says, in order that in everything... In everything, in your life and in the church that belongs to Christ, that in everything God may be glorified. How is God glorified? Through the preeminence of Christ. To Him belongs glory and dominion now and forevermore. Amen. And so that is the two pre, that is, you have been saved and gifted by the grace of God in Christ, and you have been saved and gifted for the glory of God because of and for Christ. That's what he has done in your life and in my life. So let's finish up with these takeaways. Here we are. Here's the first one. Let's just, now you're going to say, Harry, these are obvious. I know they're obvious. But folks, I'm, gonna do, I'm trying to do what my granddaddy used to do, my mother's daddy. Uh, he, was, he was a carpenter. When he'd build things, he always said, son, go back and set the nail. So I'm trying to set the nail for this in your life. I want to set, not just hammer it down. I want to set it for you. So here's the first takeaway. The first takeaway is this, is that each and every Christian has received a spiritual gift by God's grace. You know what I was going to do? Uh, I, I, I came very close to doing this, and I didn't do it in the first service, so sit easy. I'm not going to do it in the second service. I was just going to have everybody who has publicly confessed Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and surrendered Him to stand. And, uh, but I'm not going to do that to you. I am going to ask you to, when you leave here to stand for Him when you get out of here. But I won't ask you to do that now. But I do want to tell you this. The reason I was going to ask you to stand, because I wanted to tell you face-to-face, heart-to-heart, you got a place on the team. It's an important place. Nobody else can take your place. There's nobody gifted like you. You remember one guy talks about spiritual gifts. Given, remember what we just, remember what you just confessed? By the Holy Spirit as God sovereignly has appointed them. You are a testimony of God's unique fashioning for ministry. Now all of us are supposed to worship. We're to share the gospel. We're to disciple. We're to grow. We're to love one another. We're to pray. But some of you are gifted to pray. Some of you are gifted in worship. Some of you are gifted in evangelism. Some of you are gifted in leadership. 
Some of, we all are to lead in our families and lead people to Christ, but some of you are gifted to lead. And, you're, and not only that, your gift of leadership is not repeated in the lives of other leaders. Your gift of prayer is not repeated. You have a very special gift of prayer, a very special gift of evangelism, a very special gift of disciple-making. That you have that. It's like one guy pictured it like a snowflake. The snowflake as it's fall, here's in this in this way. Every snowflake just looks like a snowflake. But if you put the microscope, you see no snowflake is like another one. They're all unique. So we all have the gifts to serve the Lord with worship, evangelism, love, and prayer. But we are shaped in a certain way that nobody else has. You know something else we learned about that snowflake? Not only is it unique, but it changes its configuration as it comes from the clouds down to the earth. Your gift is not only unique, it's not static. There's Philip, a deacon, ending up as an evangelist. There's Stephen, a deacon, ending up as a preacher. Your gifts are not static. They develop throughout your life. But each one of you have one. There is no useless Christian. There is no giftless Christian. There is no... uh, There is no... um, There is no exception. Every Christian has a unique and important gift in the body of Christ that is at work, and no gifts are superfluous. Everyone's crucial, all of them. In fact, sometimes, well, let me, let, me do, let me go and give you number two. Number two is this. I'm, I'm going to move ahead. Each Christian is responsible to develop and deploy their spiritual gift. You're supposed to develop your gift as a good steward. You're supposed to deploy your gift as a servant. And you're to, you got your gift. Be a good steward. Stir it up. Remember what Paul said to Timothy? Stir up the gift that's within you. Develop the gift that's within you. Work on the gift that's within you. Stir it up that it might be used, that it might be effective, that it might be there to serve the Lord. It's not static. It's always developing. Then keep developing it. And then the best way to develop your gift is to start using it. Folks, you can turn a ship that's moving a lot easier than one that's, that's sitting still in the harbor. So just get engaged. Start using your gifts. Get feedback from people. So you, de- you develop your gift as a good steward. You want to be faithful. What gift has God given to me? I want to develop it. I want to use it. And then you use it as a servant. Um, you know, when you do hospitality, I tried to use uh, Pastor Martin's illustration. You want your home to have an open door and a shared table. In servanthood, just look to Jesus. Live with the basin and the towel. I graduated from Westminster South. When I graduated, I went across, and the dean gave me my diploma, written in Latin. I still can't interpret it yet, but there it is. He gave me my diploma, and then he gave me a towel with my initials on it. He said, congratulations, you now are qualified to wash feet and serve. And therefore, it hangs in my office to remind me I wasn't called to be at the top of a heap. I was called to the basin and the order of the basin and the towel. We've got to develop servanthood be good stewards, stir up the gift so that we can use these gifts for the Lord and then start watching them. Let me try to give you this illustration. In my first congregation I pastored, we started small groups, and there was a guy in the church, young guy with a wife and a couple of kids. He said, Pastor, I love small groups. I said, great. I'm going to call him Joe. That wasn't his name, but I don't have his permission, so I'm not going to use his name. But Joe, I, Joe said, Pastor, I love small groups. I want to lead a small group. And I said, well, let's find out. Why don't you go with me? I'm starting a small group, and you 
you come and help me, and then I'll hand it off to you. So we started with six couples, counting his, um, me and Cindy and he and his wife. And when we finished, we had, we had four more couples, and it grew to about 18. And I said, okay, we're going to, I'm going to hand this off to you, Joe. And I handed it off to him, and I went off to start another small group. Well, about three months later, one of the people in the small group called and said, Pastor, is it okay if we come to your small group now? I said, no, no, stay in that small group where Joe's leading. He said, well, we're not meeting anymore. It just kind of went down to two couples, and we've quit meeting. So I went and rescued Joe, and I said, Joe, come on, let's do this again. So we did it again. You know what happened. I handed the second group off to him, and it went down to nothing. So I, you know, I'm, I know if you keep doing the same thing, you got failure. That's not a very smart thing. So I said, well, come on, let's do it again. But this time, I'll lead it, and you and your wife host it. Let's see. Let's just kind of work through this. Folks, it was unbelievable. That, that small group became the multiplier of small groups in our church, and it was because Joe and his wife were unbelievable hosts. You see, Joe, here's what happened. Joe loved small groups. So he assumed he had a speaking gift of a small group leader. But the reality is he had a servant gift of being a host. And he became host par excellence. He became the guy to train hosts because that's what he had. And the two worked together, speaking and serving, but, uh, but now he found out. When did he find out? You got to get in the game. That's when you find out where your strengths are. And that's how you begin to develop them. So get in the game as a good steward, as a good, with a servant's heart. Number three, every Christian has received a unique and useful gift, so there's no need for jealousy and no room for pride. No need for jealousy. Oh, I wished I had their gift. Yours is important. No need for pride about your gift. You just ought to be amazed at it. Go, let me go back to football for a minute. Go meet a quarterback who gets most valuable player, and they give him a lot of money, and they give him a lot of trophies. Go find out what he does. Can I tell you what he does? In fact, any quarterback will do this at the end of every year. He'll find something to go buy and give to those linemen. Rolex watch, um, 58 Corvette. Uh, he'll find something to give to those linemen because he knows without that blindside tackle, without that, guard, that pulling guard, without these guys, I'm nothing. I am absolutely nothing. He know, now, they don't get the fame. They don't get the plaudits. They don't get the, they don't get the headlines. But he knows without them, I'm nothing. The more visible actually understands the, those less visible are actually more important or he couldn't function at all. Every time you walk in here and you sit down somewhere and there's a nice place for us to sit down, well, join me on Tuesdays when I go around and I have the opportunity to meet the people who make those rooms happen for you and me. Without them, we would be scampering every single Sunday, every single Wednesday night. But nobody knows the names, but you do. And they're all important. I am so appreciative of, of maybe this illustration. This morning, I got up and I got ready to come. And in the shower, there's a deposit of hair. And when I come, in fact, it's, you know, my wife says, okay, honey, it's time to get your hairs cut. All 18 of them. I still pay the same thing. I don't understand that. But... Uh, but and so my hair's falling out. I look in the mirror and I, you know, comb it and then leave. And thinking about the hair that's falling out. Well, let me ask you: If my hair falls out every single day, will I live? But you know, I don't ever remember sitting there looking in the mirror and saying, I "Wonder how my liver's doing." Well, your liver falls out, you're done. We look at the visible. But even in the body, that metaphor for the church, what's more important, what you see or what you don't see? Heart, lungs, liver. Those are the things that are crucial. So here's your last two, and I'll close in prayer. Here's your last two. Number four is this. The functional use of our spiritual gift is for the common good of the body of Christ. You've been saved and gifted personally and uniquely to serve and steward your gift for the benefit of the body. 
and you need to show up. I like the way my, my free will Baptist pastor friend says it, Al Davis. He says this, folks, you either use it or lose it. Now, God's going to get his work done. You either use it or lose it. So we got to quit playing drive-by church. Well, I'll come to church on Sunday morning if it kind of fits into my schedule, okay. The church is the body of Christ where we are committed 100% in the community of believers to minister to one another. And it doesn't stop at 1210. It doesn't stop then. It carries us right on through. So I want to challenge you to realize your functional use of your salvation and your gift to the glory of God is to care for one another and show up. When I was a kid, my mother used to give me a dollar to go downtown on Saturdays. And when I got, when I got downtown, uh, 10 cent round trip on the bus, uh, 5 cent I could get a bag of, uh, I could get a pea shooter with a bag of peas. Do y'all know how fun that was back when I was growing up? I mean, there was no air conditioning. You're riding in the bus, cars pull up beside you, windows are down, you got a pea shooter, man, you can fill in the blanks for how much fun that was. And then, uh, and then I'd get there, and then I got, a, I got 25 cents to go to the movie, and I'd stop, and I'd get, I got an orange, I got a hot dog, I got uh, uh, popcorn, and then my dollar went a long ways in those days. I loved it, but I'll never, here's what I don't, here's what I'll never forget. When I would leave Sears and Roebuck to walk to Carolina Theater, I always past the White Castle restaurant. It was a hamburger place. And when I walked by White Castle, there was a guy out front with no legs. He had a leather saddle that was under his two stumps. And he was blowing on the harmonica. He couldn't play it, but he was just blowing on the harmonica and people would come by. Every once in a while, the quarter would miss, but he didn't miss that quarter when it missed. And he'd grab two blocks of wood and he'd put them on his hands and he'd push himself up and he would walk on his arms over. He'd get the quarter, throw it in the hat, put the blocks back on, get back, walk his way back, and sit down. So he made do. He made do. Folks, can I tell you, that's the way we are in the church a lot of times. We got a lot of arms that are doing the work of legs because the legs just aren't showing up. Now, God, by the strength that he supplies, will get it done to the glory of God. But you miss the blessing if you don't show up, and we don't do it as well as we could if you did, because nobody is gifted like you. And when we all show up and God puts us in our place, just ask him, are you able to get around on those two arms? Yes, sir, I'm able. Would you rather have those blocks of wood, or would you like to have two legs? If we could have those two legs together, working with the arms, working with the hands, and all of, the, all of the, every joint supplying that which God has gifted us to do. And finally, the ultimate use of this, the ultimate use of this is for the glory of God. Our spiritual gifts are there so that in Christ He would receive all the glory and the dominion now and forevermore. So I'll just close in prayer, but uh, we'll say this to you. Um, you're going to, people are going to use their gifts and they're going to bless you and you with Christian gratitude are going to go up to them and you're going to say to them, my dear friend, thank you so much. Your act of service, your speaking, your Sunday school class, your this, your that, it meant so much in my life. Thank you. And more than likely, you know what they're going to say to you? Praise the Lord. I want you when you hear that to know, and hopefully it doesn't, that's not false humility. That's really their heart. And that ought to be my heart. Pastor, thank you for the sermon. Praise the Lord. That's not false humility. I am astonished I get to preach. I am amazed that God allows me to serve him. And when he uses it, that's astonishing. So praise the Lord. And that's the heart that we develop. Praise the Lord. John Pollock, I read the biography of Billy Graham when I was grappling with a call to the ministry, and Billy said, they said to him, what's making your success? Is it Cliff Barrows? Is it just as I am? Is it the altar call? He said, no, no. And he gave the name of a lady who in her retirement got the list of the crusades, and the week before every crusade, she went and rented a hotel room and prayed the week before, prayed the week of the crusade, and stayed the week and prayed afterwards for the follow-up. He said, there's the key. Nobody knew her. There's no little people. 
no little gifts. You are uniquely gifted. God's given you that. Be a good steward with a servant's heart to the glory of Christ. Work in concert with the body of Christ. Come on, get on the team. Let's play the game together. And may Jesus be exalted. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the moments we could be together in your word. God, I thank you so much for this rich word from Peter, for your people, old Christians, new Christians, young Christians, mature Christians, male, female, rich, poor, doesn't matter. We're saved by grace and we're gifted by grace. And you have put each of us in the body where you desire us to be. Now give us servants' hearts and make us good stewards. And as we minister with one another and to one another, may Christ alone be exalted. And we can say, praise the Lord. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Holy Spirit, just speak. In Jesus' name, amen.